Welcome to The Art of Liberty, the unauthorized radical libertarian podcast with George Donnelly and John Tyner. If you want to maximize your freedom in the real world today, this is the podcast for you. Today is July 15th, 2013, and we're talking about the news. Good morning, John. How are you doing today? I'm doing good. How are you doing? I am rising above. That's what I'm doing. <laughs> You've been busy this week, huh? It's uh, been really insane on multiple levels, yeah. Yeah, it seems like it. I, I saw on Facebook I loved the, the thing, the one comment I love the most, somebody said, Adam, Adam's really getting his money out of you. <laughs> yeah, We're yeah. getting his money's worth, at least. Yeah, for those of our listeners who don't know, Adam uh, Kokesh was... Um, uh, his house was raided uh, Tuesday night, and he's in a Virginia, the Fairfax County uh, prison there in Virginia. And he's a customer of Shield Mutual, my business, and so um, you know, I've been working to uh, to help him since then. Yeah, how's how's that been? How's that been going? Well, let's see. This is it's different this time around. Uh, the the charges are different. Um, the um, people are, uh, I notice, a little bit more scared um, this time. And there may be a little bit of fatigue, too. You know, kind of like, hey, again. Um, yeah. Yeah. And so yeah, I, the popular response and support of Adam has not been as uh, great as it was last time. Uh-huh. Yeah, I I get the sense just from watching that the uh, the government's serious this time, or at least more so than they were last time. Yeah, you know this is Virginia, the good old boys, um, and uh, it's a law. Well, it's a DC law, though, isn't it? No, no. Yeah, this has a lot of people confused. Uh, I was initially oh, okay. confused as well. Basically, what happened is U.S. Park Police uh, got a search warrant because they want to show prove that. Uh, Adam uh, actually did have a uh, shotgun and load it and carry it openly uh, and transport it into D.C. for that July 4th video uh, where, okay. he, where he, he supposedly does that. And so they went into his house, uh, basically super swatted out uh, with two helicopters, armored personnel carriers, like 40 guys, uh, at least 10 or 20 of them, you know, in the full SWAT gear. Uh, they painted the you know the whole crew there with uh, the red dots and stuff. I mean, it's just insane. It had to have been scary. I can't imagine. And um, and based, so basically, they 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 turned the house upside down, looking for a shotgun, looking for ammunition, uh, looking for receipts and things. Um, and so I suppose that they they must have found. Um, uh, you know, everything that there was there to find, um, they certainly took their time. They were there for like five or six hours. Yeah, it sounded to me like they were actually trying to crack, like pry open his safe. Like he wouldn't give them the combination. So they were there with crowbars and whatever to try and just pry it open by brute force. Yeah, yeah. And uh, reportedly they did. I've seen photos of the, the, the safe, you know, after uh, okay. the raid. Yeah. Um, and so um, in the process of all that, they claim, uh, U.S. Park Police claim that they found um, psychedelic mushrooms. Okay. Uh, yeah, and there's some dispute there because the, some of the people who live in the house who were bound, uh, you know, and had to sit on the floor while this was going on uh, with their hands behind their back uh, said that the Park Police brought in brown paper evidence bags that appeared to already have things in them. Okay. So, um, you know, I don't know. I'm not sure what to make of that. But anyway, they they claim to have found uh, those mushrooms, and so I guess in, that's a. I suppose that's a crime in Virginia. And what's more, possession of a firearm together with with a Schedule One or Two substance is a crime, according to them, according to the uh -huh. state of Virginia. Of course, he didn't hurt anybody. Uh, you know, no victim, no crime. Right. Um. So the chart they have, they're holding him in a on the at the Virginia state level on those charges. So those are Virginia so, state charges. 
So he lives there with a bunch of people, right? Yeah. I mean, I don't know what the the situation is, but I guess he can be held responsible if the mushrooms, I mean, supposing they exist, that they belong to somebody else. Yeah, I I don't know. I don't know how that's going to shake out. Yeah, I know that's kind of the way it works here in California. Like, if you've got guns and your wife has drugs, you get in trouble for it, kind of thing. Oh, really? You know, if they if they find them both, yeah, like you're it's you're in trouble. Yeah, I don't really know. The law just seems like it's kind of wacky in that regard. I think they did that. I think what happened was they found that uh, they wanted to shut down drug dealing, and they found you know drug dealers have uh, guns and drugs, and so they're like, hey, you know, let's let's you know let's try to engineer an outcome here um and you know we'll make this law against having both guns and drugs you know right let's really throw the book at him <laughs> but of course i you know i really really doubt that adam is a drug dealer i, I don't get right. any sense of that at all it's yeah. just you know the, i mean if he possesses firearms i mean that's obviously you know second amendment and if he, and if if it's actually true that he uh, possesses uh, mushrooms, I mean, I, I looked up these mushrooms. I, I mean, I have to say, first of all, in college, I used those those mushrooms a couple times, and um, I looked them up, and they've been used. Uh, I mean, there's something that grows naturally, and humankind has been using those since prehistoric times for legitimate um, religious, psychological, and recreational purposes. So, interesting. Yeah. Yeah. I've now, I don't know anything about mushrooms. Yeah, it was it was actually, uh, uh, you know, I, I I had some friends who who got into this a little bit in college. I, I have to say, I didn't. It wasn't really my thing. And after you know, after a, trying a couple times just pot and, uh, and mushrooms, it was like, yeah, that's enough for me. Um, but I went to this pink. They took me to this Pink Floyd concert in I think it was nineteen ninety three or nineteen ninety four. And yeah, you can't see Pink Floyd without being on drugs, right? <laughs> <laughs> and they gave me the mush, the the mushrooms, just just a little bit, and it uh, just the whole experience, that whole Pink Floyd concert and everything was just out of this world, you know, because it was at uh, Soldier Field in Chicago, so it was open air and the sound was amazing, and then it started to rain, and so it was like a full sensory experience, right? It was just uh, oh, outstanding. That's fun. So you've probably been dealing with people a lot more than I have about this. I I actually had a chance to watch this video that he made finally. Um, uh-huh. I hadn't watched it all. I mean, I think I've told you I typically don't watch YouTube videos and stuff online. Um, but it's I've seen a lot of people that are kind of upset or scared or whatever that it seems like Adam's actually peddling violence at this point. Um, you know, in this video, it seems like he's basically, he doesn't come right out and say it, but the fact that he's loading a shotgun seems to kind of suggest, you know, you know, he's very serious in the video says, you know, we'll see you next July 4th. And while he's got a shotgun in his hands, you know, I've seen a lot of people are kind of reacting negatively to that whole thing. Yeah. I have to say it concerns me as well. Um, you know, in the run up to this July 4th that just passed, he clearly said that, uh, he was one of the aims of the march was to violently overthrow the the federal government. Um, and, uh, you know, I mean, it's, I'm not like, oh, how could he possibly talk about that? You know, I'm not like that. Uh, I see a lot of people talking about it, maybe not as openly as he is, but I yeah. see a lot of people talking about it. Yeah. I'm, so I'm kind of like, okay. You like, I'm not scandalized by that, but I'm kind of like, you know, uh, are you really sure? You know, are you you really want to go down that path? You know, right? Um, because that's that's first of all, uh, I don't think it's 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 constructive. Uh, I don't think it's going to get us to a more peaceful place. You know, and uh, second of all, it's going to end badly for the people involved. Really yeah, badly. Would, yeah, unless you unless you get a ton of people together. You know, to start that, <laughs> it's not going to end well. Well, even at this point, I mean, we're we're just we're just not ready for that, in my opinion. I mean, I don't know if we'll. If I, I hope that it, that will never be necessary. Uh, yeah, I mean, I certainly hope so. Yeah, but well, I just don't think like a, we're ready for it. You know what I mean? That, it's it's that phrase I was for that I saw and I brought up last week that you know we're past the point where to work within the system, but it's too early to start shooting. That's that's that whole bullets versus ballots thing, you know? Right. And there's a third way, 
I mean, it's not that's a false dichotomy, in my opinion. You know, should we right. be voting for the politicians or should we be lining them up and shooting them? You know, right? <laughs> I mean, that's that's a false dichotomy. That's yeah, you know, it's, there a, are it's other a funny options. thing. It's a funny, funny phrase, nonetheless, which is why I liked it at least. Yeah. So, yeah, he uh, Adam has a bond hearing. Um, this actually, it should have started. Does he October second? For for some kind of hearing? Yeah, yeah. Well, he that's the pr- that's if you can imagine that that's the preliminary hearing. Yeah, they um, expect him to sit in jail for two and a half months waiting for a preliminary he- preliminary hearing. Well, so supposedly he had another uh, bond hearing thirty minutes ago, or that started thirty minutes ago. Um, okay. And so hopefully he will get some kind of bail um, for that. Um, because yeah, if he doesn't, I'm afraid that he uh, he may have to stay in until you know at the earliest October second. Yeah. I, wow. I, mean, I don't think these charges are really at the at this point. I don't think are, they're all that serious that um, that they you know they have they can't that they can't give him bail. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Like, like I said, I got I got the sense they they don't want to this time. And that's not really based on anything other than my own just kind of, you know, watching, looking in from the periphery kind of thing. But, yeah, I just I get the sense they're they're kind of through with him. I I think they routinely, uh, you know, it's funny. I don't know if it was an act or not, but I I called around last week to to local uh, lawyers, to the public defender's office, and um, they didn't know who Adam Kokesh was. (laughs) Well, maybe not down at the well low level there. Yeah, but it was. But even the lawyer, like an ACLU recommended lawyer, didn't know who he was. And I, I'm not. I'm didn't not know sure. that he'd been arrested, or didn't even know who he was. Didn't know who he was. Oh wow, I'm kind of surprised so, by that. Yeah, I don't know if that's an act. So, so we we may, or if it, you know, so we, I think one has to be careful not to overestimate his, um, you know, his name recognition. And it may be less about about him than it is about the judge and the way they do business down there. No, it's not business. The way they do oppression <laughs> down there. Yeah, um, you don't want to get yourself confused with. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I, I think that these charge, the charges that they have against him at the moment are really not. I mean, I think that's that's br- everyday bread and butter for those courts. You know, I mean. Okay. One count of a drug and one count of a firearm. I mean, that's. I mean, if they had found like a whole arsenal, or if they had found like, you know, a whole, uh, you know, like a like a dime store full of a whole variety of illegal substances. <laughs> I mean, I think right. that'd be something else. Right. But I I I expect them to to offer him bail, some kind of bail. I think he just didn't get it last week because he he um he wasn't getting access to a lawyer and so my my understanding is that he didn't want to cooperate in um in the court procedures until he got um legal representation yeah it seemed like he was literally dragging his feet <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah and I, that's understandable you know I, I it's standard operating procedure to not see a lawyer until you first appear in court but uh that's that's really not acceptable and people people sh- have to be allowed to prepare a little bit, you know. Right. Yeah, I know. When I was arrested you- in 2010 in in a, in Philadelphia, they brought me into the federal court. Um, I didn't know what the charges were against me. I hadn't spoken with any kind of lawyer, not even a public defender. I mean, it was it was insane. Yeah, and it seems like that's probably set up to intimidate you to a certain amount. You know, you show up in court for the first time, and these people are all dressed all nice, and you basically come from a jail and get dragged in by somebody, uh-huh. and they just start reading charges against you. And you, you mean, you really, you, like you said, you have no idea what's going on until you get dragged in the door, kind of thing. Right. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, but I have hope uh, that uh, Adam is going to get out this week. Um, you know, and uh, be able to. At least continue with his business, you know, while he fights these charges. Oh, and the other, you know, the shoe that's kind of waiting to drop is um, the federal charges. Because while he was, he communicated um, while he was in there that a sheriff's deputy uh, told him that he was, um, that the, the D.C., the federal people were preparing charges of 
illegal transportation of a firearm, sedition, and armed sedition. So yeah, see that those are the charges I was expecting him to get. So it sounds like he hasn't been charged with anything federally yet. No, not yet. They're still they're still in, they're still investigating or preparing or whatnot. And what is the deal with this sedition charge? I mean, isn't that essentially just? I mean, isn't that kind of First Amendment stuff? I mean, I thought those laws got thrown out hundreds of years ago. Um, I really don't know. <laughs> I you know I don't. It could be that the sheriff's deputy just wanted to. Um, you know, taunt Adam. That could be. Because they do that. Um, or it could be serious. You know, I don't know if there's still sedition, uh, any sedition laws on the books. Uh, yeah, I guess, sure. I guess I suppose there probably are. But yeah, I just, I've, it's so rare you hear anybody charged with that kind of stuff. And I thought that even back when it first got passed, you know, back in like the early 1800s and stuff, it got tossed out again fairly quickly on First Amendment grounds. Yeah. But maybe I'm wrong. Sounds like I probably am. I think uh, my guess is that that it would please Adam to no end uh, to no end to be charged with armed sedition <laughs> because that that would put it put the whole thing back in the political court just like it was in Philadelphia and um, you Making know a First th- Amendment thing I think that would strengthen his his whole his position really yeah yeah so on a whole other topic we've talked a couple times about HOAs. Um, you know, like I belong to one here in California mm-hmm. and there's a there's a local um, legal office that puts out a newsletter every week. And the one they put out this week talks about uh, a court in Illinois ruled that HOAs can actually literally police their own streets as for traffic violations. Inter- interesting. Yeah. I mean, I thought it was I mean, first when I saw the story, I kind of rolled my eyes like, you know, Somebody had to get the courts involved to police their own private streets, you know? (laughs) And so I was reading through it, and it actually, you know, I was like, oh, okay, well, this seems right. You know, the state's not going to come in and hassle these people for, you know, imposing speed limits or whatever on their own streets. Um, And then I get down to the bottom, and the lawyer actually, um, he issues some recommendations for places here in California. He basically says, you know, this thing passed in Illinois, and I can't believe that California courts wouldn't act exactly the same way eventually. And eventually gets down and says, don't enforce the vehicle code. Instead, associations should adopt and enforce their own traffic rules, which doesn't seem too bad. Mm -hmm. Uh, But then he goes on and says that if security offers ticket a member's guest, the member is responsible for the fine, not the guest. Mm -hmm. And if a security officer stops a person who's neither a member nor a guest, then that person should just be given a warning. Hmm. Well, I I wonder, you know, how much uh, authority they have over people who aren't members of the homeowners association. Well, that's what I I guess that's kind of what I'm curious about is those people are driving on private roads. And it seems like the government is essentially saying you can't enforce anything even on your own private property. So, you know, on the one hand, I was kind of like, oh, great. The government's going to actually allow people to, you know, enforce rules on their own private property but then you get down to the bottom and this lawyer is making these recommendations presumably on having read this court decision basically saying whoa 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 you know you're still just kind of rent a cop status you know you can just kind of you can pull people over but you can't enforce fines you can't do this other stuff yeah still keeping them hamstrung right so yeah that was kind of that was kind of the, my problem with the whole thing. You know, like I said, I, I kind of thought it was a good thing at first because, you know, a lot of times whenever people start talking about how a libertarian society might turn out, uh, homeowners associations are always brought up as, you know, here's a way, you know, homeowners in a small community can enforce their own rules, um, you know, absent the government kind of thing. Right. But, but it seems like the government basically came in and said, no, no, no. <laughs> Yeah, only you know, only what we what we allow, right? Yeah. yeah. So at least they they did say it's not false imprisonment if you pull a vehicle over. But then, like I said, the lawyer kind of came along and said, "But you can't really give the guy a ticket or enforce any kind of fine or anything like that." Hmm. So I don't know. I mean, it seems like if you end up, you know, at least the place where I own, it's a gated community. So if you get in there, you know, it's not like you drove in by accident, kind of thing. You're you know, you went onto some private property. Yeah. Well, I wonder, like at your at your uh, community, I wonder if they're, you know, like a visitor comes in. I wonder if they're given any kind of a um, list of rules 
or if they have to sign any kind of contract to abide by them? No, they don't. So right. at least as, there, I mean, there are posted speed limits. So at least as far as that goes, I mean, you ought to know what what's going on as far as that goes. But there is like a uh, a five day parking limit, mm -hmm. um, and so they'll let you park up to five days during a calendar year, and you get a warning or you know a little ticket on your car each time you do it for the first five days. But basically, every time you get that warning, it basically says, after the fifth day, we're going to tow your car out of here, unless you call us up and you apply for some kind of parking permit. So, wait, so even if it's your car or just your a guest's car, car? Anybody's car. So there's there the, the parking's very limited there. Uh -huh. So there's 25 parking permits available and people can apply for them if they can't fit their cars in their garage. There's some kind you know there's some rules about it. Some of the houses are really close to the street and they have no driveway. Uh-huh. And the garages are kind of small. So if your car is too big for the garage or if you have a third car, you can apply for a parking permit. Oh, I see. I see. But basically all the all the rest of the parking is just kind of there. Like if you have somebody come over for the evening, you know, and they don't enforce this stuff until about 11 o'clock at night. So it's only really enforced overnight. Hmm. But I, yeah, that's kind of the rule is if you park overnight, you get a warning on your car for the first five days and then they tow your car away. <laughs> I, there's a big problem with parking where I live as well. These are uh, – this is a gated community and there are seven – uh, towers about seven or eight floors uh, high each and this whole area is just uh you know it's in a, a valley and there's really tight everything is you know tight space you know and uh so people so there are everybody gets two parking spots every apartment and then there's a there's a whole bunch of guest parking but so there's this is you know people here are fairly oh so what happened was the the government here, the city government, passed something called Pico y Placa. And that basically means that they decide, best, based on the last number of your license plate, uh, that two, day, two days a week, you can't take your car out. What? Yeah, yeah. It, it, that I thought is, they were going to say you can't park. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, that, yeah, and this is like the, the local government, city government thing. And... Um, yeah, they did it in, because there's congestion on all the streets uh, okay. all the time, uh, which is, of course, a government created problem. So, but right. they, so they made it worse by um, by this pico y placa thing, where you can't take your car out two days a week. So, what did people do? They don't want to take public transportation because it's um, it's not crappy. all that. Yeah, it's pretty crappy. So they they just bought another car. <laughs> <laughs> so all they did with this ridiculous pico y placa is multiply the number of cars in the valley. And no, 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 no. They're helping. They're helping the economy and in the environment. Yeah. Uh, and so, um, and so now people are having problems because there's such limited space in in this city. They're having problems of where to park all these cars. <laughs> and so everybody here has like three in some place in some cases where there are big families four or five cars so they started they parked up all the guest spots literally like 50 or 70 guest spots uh were just constantly occupied you guests couldn't find a place to park uh and so the administration had uh, the administrator decided okay no more parking and guest spots. So now all the guest spots are open all day long. Right. <laughs> but it's but it's a similar, you know, I think it's a similar kind of problem. Yeah, it sounds like it. But you know, speaking of uh homeowners associations, uh this whole Zimmerman uh Martin thing happened yeah. inside a uh a gated community, didn't it? Uh I think it did. Yeah. I mean I think that's why Zimmerman was out. He was policing the community there. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I I haven't been following that story all that closely. I've been actually hoping it would go away. Yeah, but it seems like it seems like you can't have a rational discussion with anybody who has been following it, though. I I, I have to say I haven't followed it closely either. So if I get anything wrong, listeners should uh, should definitely call in and correct me. But from what from what I saw, it's, it just briefly came from a reputable source was that uh, Martin cut through the homeowners association. Like to, as a as a shortcut, and then Zimmerman followed him to make sure he wouldn't, 
you know, do anything. And then I'm not sure what happened, but it, it supposedly it ended up that Martin started beating on Zimmerman, and like he was on top of him supposedly. And yeah, then, I got the sense from something I read yesterday that Martin's family, you know, he was, I got this sense he was staying with an aunt or something like that, and they might have actually owned in the either in the community or just out on the other side of it. Uh huh. But anyway, sorry to interrupt you. Yeah, and then so supposedly Martin was on top of him, beating him up, and uh, Zimmerman pulled out uh, a pistol and shot him through the through the heart or the lungs, something like that. Uh huh. Yeah, it's, and it seems like the who who was on top beating who is the part that's in dispute. Yeah, although I think that should be easy enough to determine because if it was Zimmerman on top, then the round would have gone through Martin and hit the pavement, and there should be some kind of mark on the pavement. Well, did it go all the way through? All the way through Martin? Yeah. At that at that close quarters, you got to think you got to think it must have. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I don't know a lot about ballistics or how that kind of stuff works, but yeah, I didn't. I didn't know. I yeah, I don't know. I yeah, <laughs> yeah. Although, if it was a if if it was a hollow point, it's 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 very um, it's very possible that it that even at those close quarters, it wouldn't have gone all the way through. Right. So that's so, yeah. definitely a consideration. Consideration. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, it seems like it seems like if it had gone all the way through, that would have come up. But yeah, I mean, for eighteen months worth of work and as many people who have followed the case, that if that's still in dispute, you know, it seems like it probably didn't. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, it seems like somebody right away would have made the same connection that you did. You know, if probably, we'd gone all the way yeah. through and it would have hit the pavement or would have hit something, you could have figured out the traje- uh, trajectory of the bullet. Probably, yeah. unless the thing just went off into the air somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So anyway, but yeah, I don't know. My my family was actually watching the the verdict when it came down. Oh, really? Yeah, like I and I was I kind of rolled my eyes cuz the the news media was just salivating all over that whole case. Yeah, I think it it was a tragedy, you know, it was a tragedy that uh that's, you know, that somebody, you know, pulled the trigger on him that that he attack I mean if it's true that the one of them attacked the other I think that's a tragedy that that one of the that Zimmerman shot him that's a tragedy uh that you know Martin died is another tragedy and that it turned into this huge media circus of profiting off of that suffering is uh you know maybe the you know is is an enormous tragedy as well yeah so on a on a less violent note um you know the the last couple of weeks, the Supreme Court ruled on the whole gay marriage debate, mm-hmm. um, and apparently, to a certain extent, at least for the there was a law here in California. You know, the voters passed a constitutional amendment here a few years back, um, mm-hmm. basically banning gay marriage. And I believe the Supreme Court ruled that protect marriage, which I think is some kind of um, anti marriage, you know, um, group. Mm-hmm. or anti-gay marriage group who were defending the law, the Supreme court ended up ruling that they didn't have standing to, to try and defend this law in court huh. and basically booted the case back down. And so it created kind of an interesting legal quandary here in California because the, la- the last actual ruling on the merits of the case was in a district court mm-hmm. that does not co- Then it doesn't cover the entire state of California. <laughs> So I guess after this ruling happened, uh, the governor basically directed all of the counties here in California to start performing marriages. Oh, and nice. so now this now this group has gone back and said the governor doesn't have the authority to do that. And I guess part of the argument is this district ruling that came down doesn't cover the entire state. Hmm. So it's it, there's a there's kind of a couple of interesting things going on here, and one of them is that. Um, so they're basically trying to haul the governor back into court and say, you don't have the authority here because this ruling doesn't cover all of California. And so you're still bound by this constitutional amendment, at least in the parts of California, not covered by the district. And the other thing that's kind of interesting that I haven't heard a whole lot of people talking about is that the governor and the state attorney general refused to, um, defend this law in court. Um, when nice. gay marriage supporters brought it. Yeah. But the law was passed by the people basically by referendum. Mm-hmm. 
And so it was kind of interesting to me that the court basically said, I mean, basically nobody has standing to defend this law. <laughs> I mean, that's kind of what it ends up being. The people pass this law and then the government says, nope, nobody has standing to defend it. That's hilarious. So why, why, yeah. you know, why? So for me, my question is why, you know, can they, can the, the attorney general do that for that, you know, can abandon that law? But he can't abandon, you know, it's more she harmful laws. Oh, she. Why can't she abandon other more harmful laws? You know. Yeah. Well, and I suppose she can. They just typically they don't unless it's politically in their favor to do so, mm. like it was in this case. Yeah. But yeah, it just seemed kind of interesting to me. You know, California has this referendum. I don't know what you call it, possibility, or you know, the law is set up in such a way that the people can just pass laws absent the government, kind of thing. Mm -hmm. You know, by a simple majority vote. Um, but when those get taken to court, nobody apparently has standing to defend them. So the people have this way to basically bypass the government and put laws in place that they want, but then can't take them to court and defend them. So, you know, it seems like it's, it's kind of this end run around that whole thing is if the people pass a law, all somebody has to do is take it to court and get the court to rule that nobody has standing to defend it. Yeah, that's, that's a pretty big loophole there. Right. So or was, basically one person with enough money to 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 pay, cover the filing fee can uh effectively um what overrule who perhaps tens of millions of people, right? Yeah, I mean as long as they can show that they I guess as long as they can show they have standing, you know, that they've been harmed by it in some way. Mm. So it was it was just an interesting thing and I don't know that the question will ever get resolved and you know, don't get me wrong, I'm not I'm not on the side of these guys trying to to uh to get gay marriage uh made illegal again um although i'm not sure that getting the government to start you know getting the government involved in everybody's marriage is the solution to this problem either uh but just legally it seems like it's about to create a whole legal mess you good know, I, this... I love it when they lock up you know when the, <laughs> yeah. when the, the gears of, of the state lock up against each other that's yeah because i guess even the ag or the attorney general here even issued some kind of opinion that was basically like look the feds ruled on this and there's nothing the state can do because you know federal law trumps state law in this regard um you know that was the kind of the brief i think she submitted to um this case that's been brought again by this group protect marriage hmm. so it's it's kind of interesting for me. I'm kind of like, you know, I'm not, I didn't ever study the constitution or anything, but I'm just kind of a legal nerd in that regard. When that kind of stuff gets brought up, I kind of follow it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hey, uh, I saw a really interesting um, article on Reddit from Germany that uh, I actually it's a, I have to translate it from the German. Basically, some guys uh, over there online, they decided that they were going to walk to a uh, what's called i guess the dagger complex and okay. it's an nsa installation in germany is uh, it one of these places that has like the big white dome kind of things out there well i'm looking at a picture of it and it's basically uh just all that uh you know you can see in the picture is a big fence with tons oh, okay. of barbed wire on the top all right yeah but apparently it's an nsa listening post and um you know the and they went to to decorate the fence with flowers it says um and uh but so they were you know the police came and shut them down yeah big surprise yeah so it was kind of like you know hmm you know somebody was surveilling our conversations and found out about it and <laughs> came and shut us down before we could do it <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if there weren't just like microphones and cameras and all that stuff just sitting out, you know, around on the fences out there. Mm, yeah. Yeah, I'd be surprised. I'd be surprised if like remote. I mean, I don't know how remote this place is, but I'd be surprised if those things are really heavily staffed kind of thing. You know, it, it seems like a lot of those places are just there's a big fence up around one of those big white domes, like I was saying, and they've just got a bunch of satellite dishes sitting there. Yeah, I'm not sure. Yeah, it's it's translated from the German and not very, not exactly very well. So, but I, I thought <laughs> that that was really, you know, interesting. Hey, let's go lead a protest against the. Oh, knock, knock, knock. 
No, you <laughs> cannot go lead a protest against oh, wait, the NSA. They, wait, wait, wait. You're mean, you mean they went and they went and visited these people before they did the protest? That's what I understood. I mean, it's not. Oh. I'm I'm running just basically off a Reddit headline and a bad translation here, but that's that's what it sounds like. Yeah. Oh, I thought you were saying they actually they were there at the fence placing the flowers, and the police showed up and said, "All right, move along." No, like I didn't no. realize you were saying they actually came to these guys' house ahead of time. That's that's the sense that I'm getting from it. So oh, far. well, now that's crazy. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know. That's scary. I mean, I, I, I'd i be pretty scared if the cops showed up before I even went and did anything. I mean, that's literally a thought crime. Yeah. Yeah. That's that's the situation we're, we're in. Wow. Um, yeah. And that, that the other thing I wanted to get to today was... Um, I saw uh, this article last week and some philosophy pro- protester had written a blog. I guess it was on, you know, New York Times kind of has these blog entries. I guess they're op-eds, but online kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, and he wrote this article about um, why privacy matters. Oh, and he, there's, yeah. there was a passage in there where he basically says, you know, imagine I could understand all of your thoughts, you know, telepathically kind of thing. Like you don't share them with me. Like I can just. I have access to what's in your head all the time, anytime, whatever I want. And there's nothing you can do about it. And he basically goes on to describe, you know, the huge power imbalance that that creates. Um, And, you know, basically says too, you know, at some point, you know, I know what all your fears are. I know what makes you tick. And to a certain extent, I can begin to control you by playing on those fears. Yeah. And basically explains, you know, this is why privacy matters, especially, um, in a case of the individual versus the state. And I just thought it was really fascinating. I'd never read that kind of thing before. And the other thing I really liked about it was I'd never seen a good um, counter argument for the, you know, if you're not doing anything wrong, you've got nothing to hide argument, yeah. which I've heard people make. And, you know, the only, the, the only one I've really ever heard people come back with is, well, if I'm not doing anything wrong, why do you need to look? Which seems kind of weak in my mind. Mm. You know, you know, it's a it's a witty retort kind of thing, but it's kind of a weak argument, I think. Yeah, I I, I think I saw that same article. Um, my memory's kind of fuzzy of it, but yeah, I th- that was really well done. You know, because basically, if you have all my information on me, um, you know, you can. You can control me. You can devise strategies for controlling me. You know, if you know that I'm walking out my front door, um, you know, you can go and, you know, make things happen that is going to, you know, could scare me or, you know, intimidate me or, you know, you, if you know where my bank accounts are, you know, you can uh, create problems for me with that. You know, if you know where I work, you can go and intimidate my boss and get me fired, um, you know. Yeah, well, and the guy even goes on to talk about, um, you know, what it means uh, for, you know, Google and stuff listening even. You know, he was like, you know, there's a lot of teenagers and stuff who are still exploring their sexuality and aren't very sure of themselves, you know, and they get on Google and type, am I gay kind of thing. Hmm. And they were just like, you know, even just playing on those kind of fears, you know, if you're afraid somebody's going to find out about that, you know, you can start, you know, blackmail comes into the picture. Mm, Yeah. You know, and it's, you know, not only can you essentially, like I said, exercise a certain amount of control over people by threatening with them with that, but I imagine it's, it's, there's a lot of psychological, I don't want to say damage, but, you know, it's certainly going to wear down on your morale kind of thing to know that that's hanging over your head. Yeah. In the past, I remember that people, an easy way to discredit people was by saying that they had visited like a psychiatrist or a psychologist. Right, I've been hearing a lot about that because they did that to Daniel Ellsberg when he released the Pentagon Papers. Right. And just the fact that Adam Kokesh has admitted that he suffers from PTSD, that has been used to discredit him as well. I'm kind of surprised by that just because, you know, a lot of the – and one of the the other stories I read this week was about the TSA. And it seems like any time anymore you hear about some kind of TSA abuse, it's against some kind of military person. And that seems to get people's attention, you know, and it's look at these people, they go out and they defend our freedoms and we need to treat them better when they get back. Hmm. And it's kind of surprising to me that PTSD gets used in the way you're describing, you know, to discredit people. You know, Hmm. it seems like the easy argument to that is, you know, look, I went overseas and I defended freedom and, you know, I ended up with these problems and you ought to be trying to figure out how to help me, you know, not 
trying to turn that around on me in some kind of some kind of way to take away my rights. Well, you know what? Shell, uh, sorry, you know what PTSD used to be called, right? No, or shell, you, you shell used, shock, right? And it used to be, uh, it was like you know World War II, Vietnam, and stuff. People who suffered for that were treated like, um, like they were you know weak, like they were pussies, you know, and they couldn't handle it. So there may still be some of that um, prejudice, you know, floating around um, in people's minds, you know, older people's minds who are, you know, aware of that. Huh. Yeah. I mean, I wouldn't think, I wouldn't think, I wouldn't think you'd be getting that from, you know, the civilians. I could certainly see that coming from other military people. But I, I remember even, uh, Vietnam era, um, people getting, um, you know, like, uh, you know, you didn't, you didn't measure up, you know, you're too weak, you know, this yeah. other guy, my brother came back and he's fine. You know, what's your problem? You know, you just want to hand out and blah, 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 blah. Right. Huh. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, the, the, the guys who came back shell-shocked. I mean, PTSD is, didn't have, wasn't recognized until fairly recently. And the guys It was after came, the first Iraq war, I think, right? Yeah, and the guys I mean, who, But at least then it was called Iraq war or, you know, Gulf Syndrome or whatever, right? Or is that something different? I think that's something slightly different. Okay. Yeah. But um yeah, that was people who came back, you know, that way were were shunned and, you know, thought to be uh, you know, just weak. Um, you know. So, yeah, but I I um <clears throat> what was I going to say? Yeah, the whole psychiatrist thing, you know, they find out that, you know, you have visited a psychiatrist and all of a sudden it's he's mentally unstable. And you know, the psychiatrist could have been a marriage counselor, you know. Uh, you know, for all anybody knows, um, yeah, and that well, and you here, know, yeah, I was gonna say here in California, if you get, you know, that kind of stuff is uh grounds to have your gun rights revoked, right? Yeah. So I mean, look at how you know urgent it is to protect that kind of privacy. Yeah, I don't know what the law is like out there in Virginia where Adam is, so I don't know if that's going to play into that or not. Hmm. Yeah. But yeah, I know at least, at least out here, like I said, even I think I think it might even be a federal thing, but like a domestic violence. I mean, that's not necessarily a psychological problem, but domestic violence is grounds to have your gun rights revoked, I think, for forever. Yeah, I've heard that as well. Uh, one other little uh, piece of news that I that I came across that I thought was uh, just, you know, another example of just things going be out of control is in the UK. Um, at the border, you know, when you come into or leave, I'm not sure if it's just when you come in or when you leave also, but um, they can simply seize your phone and down completely download all data that you have on it. Uh, it says the title from the Telegraph, the UK Telegraph, is Traveler's Mobile Phone Data Seized by Police at Border. And the subtitle is thousands of innocent holiday makers and travelers are having their phones seized and personal data downloaded and stored by the police. So the United States Constitution Free Zone idea has made its way to Britain now? It sounds like it, yeah. It's a, the, <laughs> well, like, they don't – that island's not that, that island's not that big. I mean here I think like they say the Constitution Free Zone extends like 100 miles in from the border, but that would be that whole country. <laughs> right. Yeah, it says it's so broad that they don't even have to show reasonable suspicion for seizing the device and they can retain the information for as long as is necessary. You know, in quotes, as long as is necessary, you know. Right, by basically, them. We, see it's, we say it's necessary, therefore it is. Yeah, uh, and uh, that's, that's pretty insane. They're saying up, up yeah. to 60,000 people a year are subject to this. Does the, the article talk about how that's going over with the people there, the population? Is it is it British citizens or is it just travelers coming in and out? Seems like it, it's anybody. Yeah. So is that going over well with them? I mean, they seem a little further ahead on their way to police statism and, uh, than the United States is. Yeah. The article, I'm not seeing anything where it talks about a public reaction. It just seems to have, um, you know, police and police, um, you know, comments. Uh, and police and government comments. It's for people's safety. <laughs> yeah. For the good of the people. We need to know who you're talking to, who you're sending texts to. You know, we right. need to know who your Facebook friends are. Because, I mean, when you get somebody's phone, 
you you more li- more uh, likely than not you're going to get their Facebook password. You know, yeah. and I mean yeah. that for a lot of people that opens up their whole personal network. Yeah, well, if your phone's unlocked, I don't think Facebook doesn't even require a password unless I think you log out every time. Right. You know, yeah. on your phone at least. Mm-hmm. And um, I, you know, the way they suck the data off the phone, I don't think you're even required to enter your your passcode. Um, I don't know. I know the the latest uh, you know Apple devices have a little bit stronger security, but I don't know if that's going to protect you from yeah. this. They, I mean, they have I remember, special machines for this. For, for yeah, I remember, the data off. Few, I remember reading a few months back they were saying that about at least about um, iPhones, where the police had worked up some deal where they could just plug in and suck all the data right off the phone, whether it was locked or not. They've had that for several years. Yeah. Yeah, I just read about it fairly recently in the last few months, I think. Yeah, it's, um, you know, it's worrying. And, uh, you know, I mean, pretty soon it's going to be, I mean, and already, already, you know, if you go into the United States and you carry a computer, they have the right to, uh, or in their opinion, to take that computer, to download everything, and even to keep the computer for as long as they think is necessary. Yeah, right. I think... W- wasn't it like six months? Didn't some judge rule recently at least limiting it to like six months or something like that? Oh, really? I, I missed, I, missed I, that. I could be wrong. I could be wrong. There was some case recently that happened like that, um, and they kept some guy's computer, and the judge basically said, you can't just keep this for indefinitely. I I could be wrong on the, the details. Hmm. And there was actually yeah. a guy who was working on open source software or something related to encryption or security who, who fell a uh, victim to this. Yeah, there was, was. Is that Jacob Applebaum? He was the guy working on WikiLeaks, right? Um, maybe, maybe that might I, be what I have in mind. Yeah, he he was the one I have been reading about. And during the course of reading those stories, they were actually saying, um, you may as well just wipe your laptop and put all your data on a flash drive and email it to yourself, or not, you not email it, but like FedEx it to wherever you're going. Oh well, yeah. Yeah. You know, FedEx yourself a Windows or whatever installation disk and a USB drive with your data and wipe your hard drive when you cross the border. Yeah. Which seems absolutely ridiculous. I mean, it's it's a way around it, but what a hassle. Mm. You know, and then I get to thinking like, you know, people, everyday people are having their data seized like this. And, you know, if you're actually doing something illegal, like you got to be smart enough to know this stuff's going on and you're going to actually mail your data. Yeah, or or Dropbox it, you know? Right, so it seems incredibly unlikely that these border searches are actually going to catch anything. You know, I have a hard time believing they're they're for anything other than just spying on everyday people. Yeah. You know, and I, and I have, I, you know, I, I have a hard time kind of imputing a huge conspiracy to a large group of people like that, but I can't see any other end to this. You know, it's basically to collect a ton of data on everybody and eventually use it to control them. I think that the nature of of uh, government is that there could be a few people at the top who are orchestrating everything, and um, because people who work in government, they got those jobs because they know that it's really hard to get fired. It's a steady paycheck, and you know it's not particularly challenging. Um, at least a lot of them. And so they're going to do whatever you know they're ordered to do uh, within. Um, you know, I mean, as long as they're, you know, it's, I don't, they're just going to do whatever they're, they're ordered to do. And so this creates a situation where uh, it's very easy for a few people at the, the top, at the top to manipulate everything. Yeah. Yeah. Like I said, I have a, I have a hard time. I have a hard time believing that, but I'm all at the same time anymore. I'm having a hard time seeing any other end to what's going on. I think another thing is that there is via um, the media, you know, control of the media. It's very easy. It, it's it, this m- m- milieu. Uh, I'm not sure if I pronounced that right, but of ideas has been, um, uh, you know, sent out uh, via you know media channels such that it has become like like bedrock in people's minds. You know, and so everybody's operating kind of kind of off this same playbook of government power and, you know, safety uh, above everything else. And so it's it's very easy to have everybody kind of acting in unison without an explicit or wide-ranging conspiracy being in place. Yeah, everybody just kind of does it, so therefore it must be right. 
Yeah. And I mean, everybody agrees, you know, safety has to be job number one. We have to do whatever it takes in the name of safety for the children in order (laughs) to, you know, to keep everybody safe. And, you know, if that means, you know, seizing people's, uh, you know, um, computers, if it means, uh, you know, sending out drones to Pakistan that happen to kill uh, innocent people, uh, if it means wars, if it means the TSA, if it means, you know, feeling up people's junk all day long, uh, you know, if it means, you know, no, no knock uh, raids, you know, if it means the drug war, uh, if it means a war on guns as well. I mean, you know what I mean? It's it, there. There's broad agreement on this. You know, I'm so scared. We have to make everybody safe. Make me safe, <laughs> please. And, you know, so then it's, you know, the fear gives carte blanche. Maybe we can give out like purple rocks to people to keep the terrorists away. <laughs> you know, that old joke, like I've got this rock that keeps tigers away kind of thing. <laughs> like maybe we could at least give that a try. <laughs> I think we could make a fortune selling those, John. I love this idea. Yeah. I mean, the pet rock made a bunch of money, right? Yeah. 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 Like we could just selling it, you know, terrorist protection, you know, amulets or whatever. I love it. I so you mentioned this idea. The, the, the TSA there. Maybe we could wrap up on this though, at least. But the TSA apparently, I don't. I want to. I think it was the TSA, but I just saw an article really late last night. So I was got I was kind of out of it. So I apologize that I can't say for sure that this was the TSA, but I'm like 95 percent sure. Mm-hmm. But apparently they took over a soccer game in Seattle. What? And they took over a um, the security for a soccer game in Seattle <laughs> uh, a week or two ago. <sighs> And just nobody could get in. You know, the lines got huge, and you know, because everybody was getting, you know, me- the me- the metal wand kind of thing. I mean, I think it was just the metal detector, but everybody was getting wanded. Oh my god! And pe- people were just up in arms, you know, about you know. And apparently, they're they're not up in arms that they got scanned. They're up in arms that they missed the start of the game. I mean, at oh. least that's the way the the news story I read uh, played it. You know. Oh my god! Um, Are you sure this is not an onion story? Yeah, I am sure it's not an onion story. <laughs> oh, <laughs> um, but yeah. But actually, the the story, the paper at least, um, quoted, uh, I guess people commented on the sports team's website afterwards and was basically like, hey, you know, you're here to serve the customer kind of thing. And this isn't serving the customer. And, you know, if this is the best you can do, then you've got a lot of work to do. And if it's not the best you can do, why not? You know, your job is to serve the customer here and, you know, make sure we have a good experience. And this was by far not a good experience. So it seems like maybe the TSA has gone too far. You know, maybe they're now they're getting involved in American sports and people aren't willing to put up with that. Uh, well, yeah, I, I don't know. I wasn't able to find find the article just in a real quick uh, search. But, um, you know, if it hasn't gotten wide coverage yet, um, guys at the Onion, get on this, you know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's just crazy. Yeah, I was gonna say I was, I was gonna say maybe I can track it down again, but probably not. Oh wait, here we go. Yeah, I did find it. Yeah. Oh, nice. So it was a Sounders game, is the name of the team, and they were up in Seattle and they were playing DC United. Um, so maybe I'm wrong about this having been the TSA. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So I take that back. It wasn't the TSA. I think the the site that I found that led me to this one was comparing it to the TSA. So apparently it wasn't oh, the TSA. It was TSA style security. Oh, I see. Yeah, I, I, I oh, have yeah. an article uh, from Como News pulled up. Yeah. That's and, the one, yeah. And you can see the, the line. It's insane. Yeah. Okay, so yeah, that that was my bad then. Yeah, I, I guess the I found this from a blog entry where somebody was complaining about the TSA and then pointing to this. And basically being like, oh, people were upset about this, but, you know, just only because they missed the start of the game, not because it's some kind of imposition on them security-wise. So I just want to update my message to the onion. It's not too late. Get on it. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, all yeah. right. Well, let's wrap this up so you can go get on the phone with them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, um I hope that uh, listeners, you know, we didn't really have a unified topic for today, but um, I think, you know, the conversation was still um, good anyway. Um, But I hope that, you know, if the listeners, uh, uh, you guys are not uh, completely pleased or, you know, think we can do better, that you will give us a call and suggest a topic for next week. Um, uh, You can give us a call at 641-715-3900. 
extension 255-888. And just give us a call and let us know what you would like us to talk about. Because otherwise, uh, next time, we will just drone on for two hours. That's a threat. <laughs> That's a credible threat of aggression. Maybe we can, maybe we can. <laughs> Our droning on is aggression. Yes. I love it. I was going to say, maybe we could get somebody to make up T-shirts and we can give away a free T-shirt or something to the first couple people that call in and leave us a message. Oh, that's a good idea. That's a good idea, John. We'll have to work maybe on that. I was going to say, maybe if nobody leaves them, well, I was going to say now I'm probably incentivizing them to not leave messages to wait for the giveaways. <laughs> I mean, I know how badly everybody wants to walk around with an Art of Liberty t-shirt on. <laughs> and if you don't call in, we'll send you the t-shirt anyway, <laughs> and you'll have to wear it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, uh, I hope everybody has a great day. And um, thank you, John. I enjoyed our conversation today. I did too. Thanks, George. Okay. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.